Good evening. I'm Jim Madigan. Welcome to WGBY's special coverage of the convocation this week at Springfield Symphony Hall, where Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu was awarded a doctorate, an honorary doctorate degree by American International College. This at a special college convocation to honor him. The Archbishop will speak in just a few moments. We are joined here in the studio to help us get some perspective on these events by John Howell and Linda Howell of Longmeadow. Uh, John Howell was an adjunct member of the faculty at Western New England College. He was director of research for the Springfield Public Schools. Linda's background is as a nurse in uh, mental health care. And both of the Howells lived in South Africa for a total of about a year, two different times, 1989, then in 1996 and uh, also we're back just as recently as this February. So the, you were there during apartheid, after uh, it had ended and the country was really growing into its independence and, and new life. And so recently, uh, we don't have much time before the events begin at Symphony Hall, but let me just ask you to briefly put in perspective the importance, the, the international importance really of this man, Desmond Tutu. John, I'll let you begin. Well, first and foremost, the the transition from an apartheid government to a free democratic South Africa without a, without a civil war, without bloodshed, uh, was, was truly remarkable. And, it, and this is a man who orchestrated a lot of that along with Nelson Mandela and others. And, and it's such an, an inspiration for other countries around the world that you can understand why he is so important a figure to talk to people about ending oppression, ending civil war, bringing people together in forgiveness. And he's a master at it. Linda, let me ask you, and I, I'm, I'm hoping time will allow us to talk even more at the end of the program, but I know you've told me that in your profession as a mental health nurse, when you went to South Africa, you were especially interested in seeing the impact psychologically on people living under this just reign of terror for their whole lives and really not a lot of hope of, of getting out from under it. When South Africa came down in, in the, the end of the 80s, early 90s, really it was, to me, it seemed with amazing speed. I'm sure it didn't seem that way to the people there. What, what did you learn as you spent time with, with people? And I know you, you went to some of the recon, Truth and Reconciliation hearings and briefly tell us, what did you see in terms of your profession? Well, I think the, the amazing thing of being able to tell your story. These were so many uh, victims that could not talk about what had happened or, could, or no one official would acknowledge what they had been through. And um, you know sometimes we think that's not very important but when you've been through terrible trauma to be able to talk about it to some degree and then to have it acknowledged and when you have it acknowledged by somebody like Desmond Tutu, who is so passionate and is so able to be right with the person, uh, I mean, he has many responsibilities all over the world, and, but he is right there with that person going through that traumatic experience. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and the Truth Commission prepared people to testify um, they had counselors on staff. They did counseling after they they uh, spoke and testified. So there was a lot of uh, ongoing counseling for these people. And John, just a couple of minutes now before we will go to the events at Symphony Hall. But but let me ask you the the thing that again strikes me: you were there in 1989. As apartheid really was starting to crumble, a year later, Nelson Mandela is out of jail. You mentioned to me a minute ago, and you've only got about a minute and a half to talk about this, and you could take probably hours. You and Linda went to Robben Island, the, the place off, yes. off the coast, yes. where Nelson Mandela was held for 27 years. Talk yes. about that for just a moment, what, what that was like. Uh, it, it was very emotional to be able to visit the place that incarcerated uh, Nelson Mandela and others of, of that era. Uh, political prisoners that were simply uh, shut away because of the, the violence of the uh, of apartheid regime maintaining itself. Mm. Uh, all, the, uh, all of the guides on the island were former inmates who had their own stories to tell about what it was like to live in, in that kind of isolation. Mm. Um, 
it was very moving. We're very glad we did it. And I know it's long been thought that the only reason Archbishop Tutu was not in prison was because he did have the Peace Prize. He was arrested once briefly, I think in 1980, but, but released. The moral power of the world really was behind him in so many ways. That's right. That's right. And of course, the power of the church as, as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, he was the Archbishop of Cape Town and uh, well respected around the country and for them to uh, accuse him of, uh, of some sorts of atrocities would, would be ridiculous. And so he was maintained as the voice of the anti-apartheid movement. Well, again, John and Linda Howell, we thank you for being here with us. Stand by because we'll be talking more. It is time now to go to Symphony Hall where the uh, convocation is underway and we will soon hear the address by Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. I'd like to ask Peter Battelle, accompanied by AIC trustee Dr. Alan Ingram, to proceed to the podium for the conferring of Dr. Battelle's honorary degree by Vince Maniachi, president of American International College. <clears throat> Peter Battelle, native son of New York, You've already led an active and fulfilling life. You've been a clinician, educator, entrepreneur, and humanitarian. Your education in the real world was enhanced by your father, who was a police officer, and from your own experiences as a cab driver in New York City. Your more formal education came from your history degree from St. Francis University and your master's in communication disorders and a doctorate in organizational development both from the University of Massachusetts. You have had more than 35 years of clinical and executive leadership experience in the areas of special education, rehabilitation, and developmental disabilities. You have been a teacher on the primary, secondary, undergraduate, and graduate levels. As the co-founder and chief executive officer of the Futures Health Corps, you operate a healthcare staffing and management company that provides clinical intervention caseload and staffing analysis, clinical consultation, and systems analysis to over 30,000 people in eight states. Your company is founded on the values of respect for individuals, collegiality among clinicians, and the performance of authentic work. Not one to rest on your accomplishments and one willing to give back, you co-founded, along with Harold Robles, the Medical Knowledge Institute, a nonprofit foundation committed to promoting healthcare education and training as a human right around the world. Through the combined efforts of you and Harold Robles, your work with MKI earned a nomination for the prestigious Bill and Melinda Gates Global Health Award. You've been a long term advocate for people living with challenged conditions and have served on several nonprofit boards, including the Board of Trustees at American International College. Now, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of American International College, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Education, honoris causa, with all the rights, honors, and privileges pertaining thereunto. This is a very humbling moment. It's certainly humbling to be recognized by your community. Um, it's extraordinarily humbling to be on the same stage with the man who will be speaking today. It's humbling to be in the same world with the man who's speaking today. Um, you know, as, as has been said, um, when God gets around to you, he doesn't look for diplomas or degrees or awards or medals. He looks for scars. And the man who will be talking today has taken his scars and he's converted them into a way for people, human beings, to talk to each other and treat each other with civility and kindness. What an accomplishment. Uh, none of our degrees come close to this accomplishment. Um, he's coming to us as a leader, um, a leader with imagination, worldwide respect, and excitement, and a philosophy. We in America are hungry for leaders 
So many of our leaders in private and public positions have disgraced themselves, which has led to good press, but not good inspiration or advocacy for the people they lead. Why is he here in Springfield? Desmond Tutu could be in any place in the world and well invited and well respected. He's here in Springfield because he understands this is a community of progress. We're going to talk today about two community organizations, the American International College and the Medical Knowledge Institute. There are many community organizations in Springfield that are vibrant and exciting and alive. Um, this is just two that we're talking about. And we'll talk about AIC first. Uh, as you know, this is the 125th year of AIC, and the mission to transform lives is as real today as it was 125 years ago. Um, this is a very unusual place. It's a pearl. Uh, we believe that 95% um, of the students at IC receive financial aid. More than 60% of the students at AIC come from families where the parents have never gone to college. AIC truly finds a voice for the voiceless. The success of AIC is noted by many of the people sitting on the stage, both trustees and faculty who have come from AIC and have taken advantage of an opportunity given to them that is a rare opportunity Many other places would not have opened up their doors to some of these students. And the students do so remarkably well because of the ladies and gentlemen sitting on the stage, the faculty, who hold these students and support them and get them through their programs. This is an extraordinary faculty, an extraordinary place with a lot of hard work attached to it. Uh, the Medical Knowledge Institute, I'll clap to that. They don't get enough applause, actually. Um, the Medical Knowledge Institute is also a program to find the voice for the voiceless. Um, it is currently supporting almost 30,000 people in South Africa by education through prevention of curable disease. A very simple concept, and it has set up a network of services for these folks. Um, and Desmond Tutu has been a leader and a visionary, and the founder of the UL jewelry that is outside in the lobby for sale. This is jewelry made by the South African women, um, the only employed people in the organization. Um, this is an extraordinary fine organization. Both these organizations offer an, us an awful lot. They also offer us the lesson that we should have learned from Winston Churchill. Um, and the lesson is, we live by what we get. We have a life by what we give. The people on this stage are people who give. Many of the people in the audience are people who give in the organizations that they work in. That's a big difference in the world that we live in. Um, the college uh, motto standing behind me um, is translated as, after darkness, light. Uh, a few weeks ago, in an interview in the New York Times, Desmond Tutu was asked about his view of the world. And he said he's not optimistic. He wouldn't describe himself that way. Optimism is a, light word, a lightweight word uh, that has no depth to it. The word to you is his hope. Hope is much deeper. Hope is able to see that there is light despite the darkness. Uh, and today, with you, I hope that we hope towards a much better world. Um, Archbishop, there are so many people here, including myself, who are deeply thankful for you to visit our humble place in Springfield. If you're following your program, you will note that Dr. Harold Robles was to receive an honorary degree at this time. Unfortunately, due to the volcano in Iceland, Dr. Harold Robles was unable to join us. 
So we will be, he will be receiving his honorary degree at our May commencement. Now I'm going to ask Dr. Patel to get back to work again and um, go to introduce our most esteemed guest, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu. I have been impersonating people for years, and I guess this time I get to really do it. Um, my colleague, Harold Robles, um, um, is a world traveler. Uh, he founded the Medical Knowledge Institute. He's worked in many, many countries <clears throat> on medical missions. Um, uh, he's been stalled in Holland for the last six days trying to get out. Um, and supposedly he was going to be on a cargo plane but that didn't work. Um, he, um, he's resilient, though. He approached this with a bit of humor. I said to him, how are you doing? He said, well, I'm philosophical about, I'm philosophic about this volcano. He said, you know what I say to myself? Into every life, some ash must fall. <laughs> so let me read his words. Um, I can't read them the way um, he reads them in um, broken English, but I will do my best. Um, there are those whom the Creator has endowed with the supreme gift of joy, not the joy commonly associated with pleasure, but the sort that seems to thrive in the silent turmoil of sacrifice and anguish. anguish. In order for such personalities to feel this kind of joy, the Creator endows them with distinctive gifts, keen intelligence, spiritual uplift, nobility and purity of ideals, humor, and an infectious laughter. Also a unique power to discern and identify great causes and to develop the passion and fortitude to devote their lives to one or many of them. I am grateful to the privilege of knowing with deep reverence Desmond Tutu, whose noble and peerless friendship has enriched my life for more than 20 years. The Archbishop's message and his example continues to light the darkest sights of our lives, and his example will continue to strengthen all those who strive to create a world living in peace and brotherhood. The greatness of Desmond Tutu, indeed the essence of Desmond Tutu, is the man who says words and puts those words into action. What has come out of his life and thought is the kind of inspiration that can animate an entire generation. Um, the work that he's done on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission is remarkable and unique in the history of the world that an entire nation is engaged in forgiveness. He represents enduring proof that we need not torment ourselves about the nature of human purpose. If affirmation for life is genuine, it will demand from all that they should sacrifice a portion of their own lives for others. His main achievement is a simple one. He's willing to make the ultimate sacrifice from moral principle to help human beings. And because he is able to feel a supreme identification with other human beings, he exerted a greater force than millions of armed men on the march. It suffices that his words and works are known and that he is loved and has influence because he enables men to discover mercy in themselves. Desmond Tutu continues to give voice to the voiceless and bring hope to those who thirst for freedom. Your friend and brother Nelson Mandela so beautifully writes, the signature quality of Archbishop Desmond Tutu is a readiness to take unpopular stands without fear. President Obama recently called you the cantor of our conscience. I confess quite freely that I stand before you in awe, reverence, and deep humility. Ladies and gentlemen, I present you a man I'm honored to call for many years now, my very dear friend, Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu.
Now, by virtue of the authority vested in me by the Board of Trustees of American International College, I hereby confer upon you the degree of Doctor of Education honoris causa with all the rights, honors, and privileges pertaining thereunto. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Mr. President, Chair of the Board of Trustees, distinguished faculty, and very distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so very much for your warm welcome and applause. Thank you for the honor that you have bestowed on me with this honorary degree. I have usually said when I, I receive some of these honors that uh, in a way I I want to say I receive them in a representative capacity. That the, the people you really want to honor are the remarkable human beings in our country who were such an extraordinary group in their struggle against injustice and oppression. But of course, you can't, you can't give honorary degrees to a whole population. So you, you choose, uh, yes, some. And, you know, you have to say, if you are a leader, What leader are you if there aren't the followers? And usually one says, when you stand out in a crowd, it is really because you are being carried on the shoulders of others. Now don't go away with the notion, oh, isn't he, he's so, He's so humble and he's so modest. <laughs> I'm nothing of the sort. <laughs> uh, a few years ago, my wife and I visited West Point Military Academy. And at the end of the visit, uh, the cadets decided that they wanted to uh, present me with a cap uh, to commemorate the visit. And, and when I put on the cap, it, it didn't fit. <laughs> now, a nice wife would have said, oh, the cap is too small. <laughs> My wife, <laughs> as wives often do, uh, said his head is too big. But I am truly honored to be counted now as an alumnus of this outstanding institution. At a time when this college establishes a relationship with another remarkable body, Medical Knowledge Institute, And I want to join you in congratulating two members of the MKI whom you have honored, one in this convocation and the other later 
because uh, with all of the knowledge that we have, we we can be we can be put out of our stride so easily by nature, and and some some time maybe it is that uh, we are being told uh, you you need to be just a, a tiny bit uh, more humble. I've been looking at uh, Springfield and have been told uh, quite a bit about it. And you see a town, a city that uh, has in many ways uh, seen better days. There are parts of your city that uh, are decaying, there are boarded up stores. Yeah, and some of the statistics are the usual kind of statistics that indicate a Social economic pathology. I was told that one in four children here go to bed hungry. The incidence of of crime is is very high. I mean, all of the sort of usual indices of things not going too well. And, and you find that kind of setup in many parts of the so-called developing world, even in my own beautiful homeland. And thank you for honoring us with the flag of our, of our country. Thank you. Uh, and I've said how quite amazing it is that an institution such as the AIC should want to remain here. And I thought that a, a wonderful image would be to think of these two institutions, the American International College and the Medical Knowledge Institute as oases oasis, as you know, an oasis occurs in circumstances where there is devastation, very little growth, and, and the oasis provides water that can be used to sustain people sustain travelers as they go past in the arid desert. MKI goes to a South Africa. And we have, after 16 years of freedom, far too many instances of poverty the levels of poverty in a country in many parts are quite, quite unacceptable. Crime, violent crime, yeah, there's far too much of it. And life can be, can be very insecure. And we've got the highest incidence of HIV and AIDS in the world. About a thousand people 
die a day. You, it's three jumbo jets packed, crashing every day. And MKI comes along and it says, this is where we want to work. AIC says, this is where we want to work an extraordinary institution. I was told quite extraordinary in, 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 in the co composition of the, the student body that you have about a third of the students are Caucasian, Americans, a third are African Americans, and a third are international students. And lo and behold, it is a community that has gelled the kind of things that you would have expected from such a diverse community don't happen. Race is the, in a way, the irrelevance that it should be. And so may I salute, may I salute you. You are fantastic. AIC has, as you heard earlier, it's accepted students who in other places would not be granted the opportunity. 60% are first generation college graduates in, in their families. But I was also struck, very, very powerfully struck by the people who are involved in both MKI and AIC. They told me their stories. Now they I didn't ask them whether I could relate what they had told me. So, is the security here? Uh, <laughs> just, just in case they, they get so uptight that uh, uh, I, I need uh, protection. <clears throat> You heard about the fact that uh, my fellow honoree was a cab driver. The president of this institution was himself a cab driver to put himself through college. The chair of the trustees came to this country when he was six from Italy and worked himself through college. He has been a member of the board of trustees for a very long time is an alumnus of this college and the first former student of AIC to become 
chair of the board, and I think you deserve a clap. As an institution, you are saying loud and clear, whatever your circumstances, you can perform scintillatingly well. You can and you do reach the students for, for the stars. And you do prove that only the sky is the limit. The students of this institution have outstanding role models. And it is equally the same with those who are part of MKI. People who could, who could make a pretty packet at home, but have had this passion to go to Africa. And I reminded them that in fact, of course, according to the findings of archaeology, we are all Africans. <laughs> I might say, come back home. And remember to bring your dollars. <laughs> I, I should sit down because this is what I've said from my heart. To thank you. To thank you for your commitment to thank you for making God, God smile. I think, I mean, I, I've sometimes said I'm glad I'm not God. Uh, but can you, can you imagine what God must feel like when God looks at the four? God looks at Burma, God looks at Zimbabwe, to see God's children doing whatever they are doing to other of God's children. That it is God's children who were responsible for the Holocaust. It's God's children who are responsible for the suffering of so many of God's children in Gaza and in the West Bank. And, and, and you imagine God saying, whatever got into me to create that lot? And you know what? God, sh God weeps. God weeps. And some of us who are parents know the anguish that you have as you see your child making a choice you know is going to get them into the most awful mess. And there is nothing you can do about it. I mean, God looks. God was around when the Nazis decided they thought six, six, six million should be eliminated. And God, in a sense, this, this omnipotent one became impotent. 
God couldn't without cancelling out the gift that God had given of free will. God could not intervene. And it is the same, I mean, why are they doing what they're doing in, in Zimbabwe? And then, I mean, you, if you were saying, no, it's, it's only white people who do that kind of thing to black people, ah, you, you, you've got, you've realized it can't be. And, and there's a lot of wealth in some of these countries that are poor. But all of those corrupt, unaccountable leaders screw the people. And just, just imagine what it must be like to be God and be father of, and mother, mother, uh, mother, if father and mother of that lot. And you sit and you are looking at your children. Do that to your children. God weeps. I mean, Look at, look at us, look at us. They've, they've just been discussing uh, nuclear security. <laughs> and you say, what must, what must be done to get it in our heads? amount of money we spend on budgets of death and destruction. And we know, we know that it is a minute little fraction of those budgets that will ensure that children everywhere have enough to eat have clean water to drink, have a decent home, have adequate health care and education, everything, everything. And we say, no, 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 no. We, we, we must have, we must have this deterrence. And they deter nobody. This is not what I was going to be saying. <laughs> but it is to say, yes, God weeps and wonders whether he, she needed to have his head red. And then, and then, and then God sees, sees American International College. <laughs> and God sees MKI. <laughs> and, 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 and God begins to smile. And, 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 and says, ah, they are vindicating me. And, and, and God, and God, and God smiles, and it's, it's almost like rain and sunshine together. And, 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 did you see? Did you see that little angel go up to wipe the tears from God's eyes? And God says, AIC, thank you. MKI, thank you. Thank you.
Archbishop Tutu, thank you so much for that important and truly inspirational message. We couldn't have asked for a more fitting and stirring address to initiate this important lecture series named In Your Honor. At this time, we're going to have another short little deviation from our program, and I'm going to ask um, the mayor of Springfield, Dominic Sarno, to come up, uh, who would like to make a presentation on behalf of the city of Springfield. Mayor Sarno. Thank you. Thank you. To President uh, Vince Miniacci, to Board of Trustees Chairman Frank Colaccino, uh, thank you for again to continue putting international into American International. It is an honor and privilege, Archbishop Tutu, to have you here. You're a very captivating speaker, and what you have seen through your eyes, but more importantly, what you have done to open up the eyes of individuals who had their eyes shut to change and get rid of apartheid in South Africa, free humanitarian and peace efforts around the world. It would have been unheard of to have the World Cup in South Africa. Now you're going to have the World Cup because of your efforts, Bishop Tutu, and I commend you on that. Archbishop, I know it's not the Nobel Peace Prize Award, but we do want to offer you a heartfelt appreciation and thanks and the key to the city. God bless you and God bless your family. to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon in this very important event that uh, we were happy to put on as American International College in conjunction with the Medical Knowledge Institute. Uh, at this point, I would just ask that you please remain in your seats until the stage party has uh, exited the hall. Thank you very much and have a good evening. And so the uh, convocation at American International for, by American International College at uh, Springfield Symphony Hall coming to an end. Uh, and let me ask you, and, and first I do want to say, both of you had tickets to go to Symphony Hall, <laughs> and, and you were so kind to agree to come in when we called you a, a week or so ago, and we heard about your background in Ashby with us, so we, we really do appreciate it, and apologize that, that you couldn't be there breathing Archbishop Tutu's air, you know, yeah. and being in the same room. There, there's an electricity that, I, I had the privilege of just covering a news conference of his a long time ago in Hartford, and he, he is one of those people that has it, whatever it is. He, he is a, a truly unique human being. But I, I know, Linda, you, you told me, and you have written about, from your perspective, someone with a background in dealing with uh, people with severe mental illness, you were fascinated by the, the psychological impact that really the, the years of terror, and there's no other way to call it, really, of, of living mm -hmm. under apartheid, what it was like for people. And I know you, you've talked and written emotionally about attending, and I find it so ironic, it was actually Thanksgiving Day, or on our mm. calendar here, right. when you attended a, a hearing where police were, were questioned about the, the murder of seven young men. Right. They said were terrorists, everyone else said no, they were just demonstrators, no weapons, they were planted later. And right. Talk about not only that specific, but, but overall what you, with your professional background, saw and learned when you were in South Africa. Mm. Well, that, that particular hearing, uh, which happened in Cape Town in a large office building, uh, of the, on Thanksgiving Day it was the police um, who came in to tell their story. But it was in such contrast to the day before, which was the day when the mothers of these young men appeared before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and uh, Arch Archbishop Tutu was presiding that day. And um, 
these mothers learned about the death of their sons uh, on TV or they were just treated so poorly, no dignity. And uh, it was an ambush anyway. They, these young men were set up and just executed, really. And so these women um, testified in this courtroom scene. And it, it was really a sacred time um, because they told their stories with great emotion and tears. Uh, they probably had not gotten to tell their story to anyone official. And, um, and then the kindness and the generosity of Bishop Tutu and the other commissioners, mm -hmm. uh, one who, was a, who is a friend of ours, Mary Burton, um, but just her, her speaking these, him speaking these tender words of healing to the mothers and his kindness and attention to them helped to restore some dignity. I wrote down the words that he said to them at that point. He said, how much we owe to women in this country. We would, would not have won the struggle without their strength. God's reconciling love will help you. God will comfort you and strengthen you. The truth will come out. People will listen and the stories will touch their hearts. Mothers weep, but don't walk out in the street and seek revenge. And a mother responded, choking back tears. We pray, we, we ask the Lord to help us. Mm -hmm. So uh, just the fact that these, these women and so many other people uh, were able to forgive, to um, experience reconciliation. And there was a case where a police and a mother and a couple of the mothers were together in which the police acknowledged the, the terrible atrocity of this. So mm -hmm. there was, in that sense, mm -hmm. a real moment of reconciliation. But mm -hmm. to watch Bishop mm -hmm. Tutu in that setting, he, he truly weeps. He puts his mm -hmm. head down on the desk and he weeps. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know that it's real. It's not some, something mm -hmm. for show. And uh, so that whole room became a very um, sacred and emotional, spiritual place. With about three and a half minutes before we will leave the air, John, let me ask you, and, and certainly Linda chime in, but the man we just saw speak here in Springfield, the man who's come to visit, honored us with his visit here today, what a role he played, because South Africa really could have descended into horrible years, decades of, of, of terror, mm -hmm. of payback, and, and mm -hmm. just horrible violence. This man was one of the, along with Nelson Mandela, and, and many people with him, but one of the real key figures in preventing that from happening. A absolutely, absolutely. Um, uh, one story, uh, Linda and I had the opportunity to uh, go to a, a rally, shall we call it, mm -hmm. uh, in a church, and there were a lot of emotional speeches at the church. And when we, uh, when the church, when the, the rally was over and we looked outside, the church was totally surrounded by uh, police. And, uh, and like, they're gonna throw us all into, into, into prison somewhere. And out of church comes the archbishop and he talks to the head of the police and he says, you know, this is a peaceful demonstration where we mean and he, just the force of his personality changed that whole atmosphere from uh, one of fear and, and anxiety to one of, well, I mean, we, he managed to, once again, calm the waters. And, and mm -hmm. it, it, that personality just existed all the time. And it's just, just wonderful to watch. It, it, it really, it's the definition of moral authority, isn't it? When yep, someone, and, and he's, mm. he's a physically tiny man. Yeah. I, I've, I've yeah. seen him again at, at a news conference I referred to, five foot two maybe, yeah. I think. Yeah. And, and yet I can only imagine him up against these policemen, probably with guns and dogs and truncheons, and, and yet talks them down. That's right. That's right. And it's important also to know that the process that happened in South Africa uh, the work of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission has now spread throughout the world and, and South Africans are going to many hot spots mm -hmm. in the world, mm -hmm. including Northern Ireland, 
mm -hmm. um, countries in South America, and they in Burundi presently, and they are helping those countries with this similar process. So mm -hmm. that is a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And you can see in other countries around the world where you don't have this kind of um, um, desire to have forgiveness and, and truth, uh, but revenge, it never ends. Uh, the conflict goes on and on and on. So, uh, thousands of people are, and that's when God weeps. Well, John Howell, Ninda Howell, mm -hmm. thank you uh, for being here with us and uh, to uh, help us put some perspective on this program. And, and we are, and we're so sorry you had to miss <laughs> the event itself, but we're, it was nice to watch it with you both. And it was nice of you to watch it with us. Thank you for the privilege of sharing this very special event, the Convocation at Springfield Symphony Hall, where you heard a speech by Archbishop Emeritus Desmond Tutu, 1984 Nobel Peace Prize Laureate. I'm Jim Madigan for WGBY. Thank you for watching. Have a good evening.